Hello, everyone. Philip Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Today is Friday, the 4th of November, 2022. Click on the subscribe button below here to subscribe and also the notification bell in the far upper right to be notified when future episodes are going to be released. And also, if you cl click on that button, you're going to be rewarded with a million dollar uh, surprise gift uh, after you click on it. It will come straight to your doorstep. OK, today's topic is America's October 16th insurrection. We've heard of the January 6th insurrection, but we haven't heard much about America's October 16th uh, insurrection. So let's let's learn about that. When John Brown led 18 followers to capture the federal arsenal at Harpers Ferry, Virginia on October 16th, 1859, slavery had been practiced in North America for 240 years. But the continent accounted for only 5% of transatlantic slave trade during that entire period. 80% of the voyages terminated in Brazil and the West Indies and nearly all of the rest went to other parts of South America. Harsh as it was, slave life expectancy was much longer in North America than south of the continent. In contrast to, the North, to North America, slave uprisings were more frequent in South America and the Caribbean. The most notable example followed the 1804 Haitian Revolution. After most of the whites returned to France, Haitian blacks massacred nearly all the 5,000 whites remaining. Since the blacks had been emancipated 10 years earlier, their chief motives were revenge for past wrongs and redistribution of the wealth. The year after the massacre, all whites were barred from owning land, except through marriage to a black Haitian. Other notable black revolts in the region occurred in Barbados, Guyana, and Jamaica in 1816, 1823, and 1831-32, respectively. The probability of a bloody slave revolt, revolt tended to be proportional to the percent of the population that was black. Not surprising, right? The antebellum South was not immune to such uprisings. Nat Turner's 1831 Virginia revolt resulted in the massacre of nearly 60 whites, mostly women and children. LeVar Stoney, who's the mayor of uh, Richmond, has uh, put up a statue uh, in which partially celebrates uh, Nat Turner's revolt that massacred about 60 whites and mostly women and children. Nonetheless, nine years earlier than that, than that 1831 Virginia Revolt, going back to 1822, uh, 1823, Charleston, South Carolina, free black carpenter, Denmark Vesey, attempted a revolt modeled on the Haitian Revolution. His insurrection was stillborn after some fellow conspirators leaked his plans to law enforcement. In addition to Vesey, 34 of the 67 arrested conspirators were hanged. Given such consequences, antebellum whites worried about the potential for such uprisings, especially in areas where slaves outnumbered whites. In parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley, blacks composed up to 90% of the population. The area around Vicksburg, where future Confederate President Jefferson Davis lived, is an example. Is an example. Parts of South Carolina, such as the low country between Charleston and Savannah, were 80% black. As a result, antebellum Southerners resented any deliberate incitement of dissatisfaction among the slaves. Provocation to violence was especially problematic. That is why John Brown's otherwise ridiculous Harper's Ferry raid alarmed influential Southerners, meaning wealthy Southerners, slaveholding Southerners, large slaveholding Southerners. Although Brown and his insurrectionists accomplished little more than their own deaths due to the failure of the area's predominantly free blacks to follow them, items in Brown's hideaway in nearby Maryland revealed that he had big plans and was secretly supported by a cadre of famous Northern abolitionists. 
With thousands of arms available from the arsenal, Brown intended to lead his men southward along, or excuse me, southwestward, southwestward along the Appalachian Mountains into Alabama, freeing slaves as he progressed. He anticipated that the mountainous terrain was amenable to guerrilla warfare, which he could utilize until he could strengthen his force enough to challenge militia and U.S. regulars in open field battle. Other captured documents reveal that he was supported by a secret six of prominent Northern abolitionists, Thomas Higginson, Samuel Howe, Theodore Parker, Frank Sanborn, Jarrett Smith, and George Stearns. Higginson was a New England preacher and abolitionist leader. To rid the USA of slavery, he was prepared to accept disunion. Sam Howe was a New England physician and abolitionist. He was also the husband of songwriter Julia Ward Howe. After Brown's arrest, the fl he fled to Canada until Brown was hanged in December 1859. Theodore Parker was a leading New England transcendentalist and mentor to Higginson. Fatally ill with tuberculosis in 1859, he moved to Italy where he died the year after Brown's raid. Frank Sanborn was a youthful transcendentalist teacher. When a U.S. Senate committee attempted to question him about the raid, a Massachusetts magistrate used a technicality to deny federal marshals the power to take him into custody. Jared Smith was a former congressman and wealthy abolitionist. Rather than testify before the Senate investigating committee, he committed himself to a mental institution until the hearings were over. George Stearns was a wealthy New England manufacturer and had owned some 200 breech-loading rifles that he gave to Brown before the raid. Like Howe, he temporarily fled to Canada after Brown's arrest. Post-raid investigations revealed that Brown also rubbed elbows with Frederick Douglass, a self-educated escaped slave who was then America's leading spokesman for the Black community. Although Brown invited Douglas to join the insurrection, he declined. Uh, Douglas left for a European speaking tour after Brown was arrested. Eventually, however, Howe and Stearns were required to testify. Interrogated so incompetently, they were able to avoid perjury or fault admission by claiming to have never committed a falsehood in response to the narrow context of the questions. Historian James McPherson, however, concludes that upon reading their testimony, the historian, quote, will conclude that they told several falsehoods, close quote. Evidence of a conspiracy among high-level New Englanders to foment a slave insurrection on the eve of the 1860 presidential nominations and elections put the South on edge. It was one thing for abolitionists to advocate for uncompensated emancipation, let's say even uh, emancipation or uncompensated, uncompensated emancipation. It was quite another to advocate for a murderous slave insurrection like that one in Haiti. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is sort of the background on what, what led to the Civil War. You don't get a lot of this from uh, uh, other books in the Civil War, but you will get it here. Causes of the Civil War by Philip Lee. It's a $22 at Amazon and Barnes and Noble, $26 if you want an autographed copy from me. Just email me, Phil, P H I L underscore Lee, L E I G H at me, M E dot com. Now, I know many of you are aware that Confederate memorials are being taken down, base names are being changed. And the reason for that is that there's a, I, I, I think there's a, a big factor is a misunderstanding about what the Confederate soldier fought, soldier fought for and what led to the Civil War. If you want to defend those monuments, this is going to give you the information you need to do so. Otherwise, you know, you can just kiss those monuments goodbye. They are gone. This book was written for the purpose of setting the record straight on, on the causes of the Civil War, not just why the South chose to secede, but why the North chose to force the Southern, this initial seven Southern cotton states back into the Union. Okay. Uh, that's our show for today, and I thank you for watching. Look forward to seeing you next time.